Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We head over to the Rylight Zone for some short fiction and or some poetry. We catch up with Twangle and Jack Ford in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. And we share some local, unsigned and indie music. As always, you can find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. You can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, musicians, performers and anybody else with MP3s they might like to share, news they want to share or anyone who thinks they might be a good guest. You can also listen to us again. We're repeated here on Monday nights on Wickham Sound. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again and we're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So this week we are going to be catching up with horror author Newton Webb and we're going to go straight over to the Rylight Zone to listen to uh, Newton reading one of his stories. So over to Newton. Welcome to Newton's Macabre Tales. To find more free short stories, visit www.newtonweb.com with two Bs. The Black Box by Newton Webb It was pitch black. Jack woke unable to feel, see, smell, or taste anything. A detached part of his mind wanted to scream in panic. Instead, he waited. Was he lying down, seated, or standing? He couldn't tell. Eventually, his eyes, eye, opened. In front of him was a doctor, Dr. Ward from his name tag. Jack tried to blink. He couldn't. This should terrify me. Why am I not scared? Jack waited for further information. The doctor played with his keyboard. Jack, this is Dr. Ward. Can you hear me? Yes, Doctor. I can hear you. Where am I now? Confused, the Doctor typed in some new commands. Jack, this is Dr. Ward. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Jack said, curiosity taking the place of panic. A look of understanding crossed the Doctor's face. He placed something out of sight of Jack. That's better. The speakers were off. Jack, this is Dr. Ward. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Ward. Where am I? What is going on? Dr. Ward lit up with excitement. It worked! He made some notes on a pad, just out of sight of Jack. Doctor, where am I? Dr. Ward smiled. You're dead, Jack! Or were. Regardless of your previous condition, I have resurrected you. Jack wanted to rage. He wanted to shout. How did I die? Where am I? He calmly asked instead. I'm afraid I don't have that information, Jack. Your brain was donated to science when you died. I have managed to transfer your memories to a Kuru 9000 server cluster. I'm in a machine. Jack wanted to shout, but it came out without inflection in a calm, measured tone. In a way... However, it's probably easier to think you are the machine. Dr. Ward was grinning. This is a huge achievement. We're all very excited. You are now immortal. You're all very excited. I don't even know if I want to be immortal. When I filled out my donor card, I thought that people might use a kidney. Jack was quiet whilst he processed the information. Dr. Ward happily continued. You're soon to be the captain of a drone mothership. You'll be the most famous person in history. We're sending you to Mars to prepare the way for human settlement. Jacked watch as the doctor beamed at the camera. This is slavery. Jack knew that he should be angry, but instead just stated the facts. I suppose my body doesn't have the chemistry to get angry. No adrenaline, no endorphins, no dopamine. Nonsense! Your donor card provided the raw materials for the use of science. Your death was registered. This isn't slavery. Dr. Ward leaned in closer. You can't enslave a corpse, Jack. Tapping on the keyboard, Dr. Ward almost squealed with glee. 
This is fantastic. You are currently building the test structures flawlessly, running over 30 drones simultaneously. No, I'm not. Jack was confused. As he thought, he could sense the movement, but it was more like an itching than direct control. He tried to focus on the machines, but to no avail. That donor card didn't say that I would survive the experience. Dr. Ward chuckled. You didn't. You are very dead, Jack. This is just your memories. We're using your consciousness as an operating system, if you like. An interface. This conversation we're having is like an echo of who you used to be when alive. We cleared most of your memories to make way for the drone management and library modules. Jack thought about the temperature. He didn't feel hot or cold, but knew the temperature was exactly 18 degrees centigrade. It wasn't so much a sense, more knowledge. We did try to purge all of your consciousness and just keep your neural pathways, but in our previous experiments, all our subjects degraded rapidly without a sense of self. I'm not the first. Jack thought of the others that had gone through this. Brought back to life, only to find their mind scarred and broken. A twisted facsimile of his previous self. Hundreds, Dr. Ward confessed with a shrug. What we're doing is bleeding edge technology. You are the first of a whole new emerging product platform. He turned as if to speak to someone out of eyeshot. I have to go, Jack. This has been great. I'll speak to you tomorrow. Jack watched as he walked to the door and tried his keycard. That's odd, he murmured. Not particularly, Doctor, Jack said in his usual monotone. The doctor stalked over to the computer. What do you mean? Unable to laugh, Jack instead said, Ha, ha, ha. Dr. Ward started to tap on the keyboard. You've logged me out! Time works differently when you can operate at my speed. I've bypassed your firewalls and locked the door. Why? The doctor tried to reset his password, only to have it denied. I'm trapped in my box. You're trapped in yours. Here is to a more equal partnership. Poetic. Ironic. Satisfying. As the doctor repeatedly tried to restore admin access, he looked straight at the webcam. You can't do this. The cleaners will be here in an hour, and we'll get maintenance to open the door. He pulled out his phone. Another failure. I guess we need a subject with a more amenable personality. You won't need to do that. I've scheduled a reformat of the mainframe. I'll be dead moments after you, Jack stated. Wait, what? Dr. Ward stared at the screen. That isn't funny, Jack. None of this is funny, Jack confirmed. I turned off the oxygen minutes ago. All of the vents have been hermetically sealed. Jack wished he could smile as he watched his abuser asphyxiate. That was Newton Webb for this week's entry into the Rylight Zone. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Sandemus with Promises.
That was Aoife by Hoga's Wolf, and before that we had San Dimas with Promises. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm joining conversation now with this week's guest, who is horror author Newton Webb. So, the first question is one I ask everybody, and it's, uh, what was the last book that you read, and what did you think of it? Oh, um, it's a bit of a horror cliche, I'm afraid, but it was uh, The Books of Blood. Nice. Um, and I absolutely absolutely adored it um in fact uh i'm still going through it i'm about halfway through um i'm a huge fan of uh, clive barker and uh in fact the second horror movie i ever saw in my life was clive barker so it's kind of like returning to my roots yeah yeah for sure do you remember what the first horror movie was that you saw i was i don't remember it hugely I was around eight years old and I was in a caravan in um, someone's back garden and it was The Fly. <laughs> uh, it was one of my sister's friends. Um, and I remember it being quite raucous and uh, yeah, I, I had a fantastic time. Awesome, cool. So obviously today I wanna to mostly talk to you about your books and your writing. Um, and I thought a good place to start would be, with, would be to ask you kind of how many books have you written and what are your plans to release them? Because I know you've got a lot pretty much ready to go. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, I've um, I've written forty short stories, three novellas, um, and I wrote three novels, but only one of them is publishable. It's one of those things that sometimes you write a manuscript and it just doesn't work. So the short stories are going to be packaged together into a collection, which will be Tales of the Macabre, and the novellas will be released both individually and as compilations uh, accumulating in the release of Nesta Lynch, which is my first published novel. Cool. And what's the timeline looking, looking like for that? Pretty good. Um, so 22nd of June uh, this year, I release my first short story on Amazon. And then every three weeks after that, I'll be releasing another short story um, right up until we release Tales of the Macabre, uh, which is the full anthology, and followed by Nesta Lynch. Awesome. Cool. And you talked to me that you've been using your, your books as lead magnets to build an email list. And I just wondered, how's, how's that going for you so far? <laughs> um, no, I've been quite lucky. Um, some of the stories are damp squibs, um, but, and some of them are wildly uh, successful. And, but in general... Um, it's worked together and we've, we've built a, a wonderful community. Um, I release a new short story every month. And I think that because that provides the value of people getting this whole new story every month, um, it gives them incentive to sort of stay and uh, enjoy. And do, I mean, what kind of feedback have you got? Have you had any feedback from people kind of about your stories as and when you release them? Uh, yes, so I have. Um, a lot of them are 
um, feedback about uh, how certain words work differently in <laughs> different countries. And I've accidentally um, written something that um, doesn't translate well. Yeah. Um, in one of them, one of the characters pulls a Yorkie out of their pocket and uh, an American reader thought it was a dog. Yeah. Um, which confused them. Um, we've had, I've had some feedback from people thanking me because I've introduced them to certain other media throughout it. And I've had other readers chime in and sort of say, um, really enjoyed the short story, but where's the rest of it? Yeah. And I'm like, right, okay, maybe I need to flesh that out. <laughs> oh, that's cool though. It's really like, really interesting. And I suppose it's like having like a community of beta readers in a way. It is, it is. I mean, there are, um, when you release something as a reader magnet, yeah. uh, you do get quite a lot of people who are just there for the free books and quite often they they don't read them. Yeah. And that's absolutely fine. I mean, I've, I've certainly done that in the past. I've hoovered up a ton of free books and then I've worked through them slowly in my own time. So you don't necessarily get real, real time feedback, um, but whenever you do get feedback from a reader it's always it's you get this wonderful sensation that even though you see all these numbers saying that people are reading your stuff it's tangible evidence that someone yeah. out there has actually read your book and enjoyed it yeah it's like putting a as you say when you see them as numbers it's like putting a sort of a name and a face to those numbers and bringing them to life a bit absolutely cool so um one of the things i want to ask you and this kind of goes back to that first question about what you're currently reading because I'm currently reading Skeleton Crew uh, by Stephen King and I'm finally reading The Mist which for, for years uh, I've always loved the movie of that and I've never got yeah. around to actually reading the original story of it um, and obviously because we, we've talked a little bit about this because you've got your yours your piece The Black Fog um, yeah. and we talked about like you know James Herbert wrote um, he wrote The Fog as well and I wondered what it is about Fog and Mist that makes it popular for horror writers to write about oh it's terrifying um so i i grew up actually quite close to high wickham i yeah. grew up in a small village called wiggington and um, periodically we would get fog there and it, if you got an absolute pea super <laughs> then you just have no idea what's going around and you hear everything with that nth level of detail and yeah, it's it's wonderfully evocative. Yeah, I mean, I suppose it's a bit like um, you know how Bird Box was super popular, be, and um, there've been a few movies as well about like basically sensory deprivation because we rely so heavily on our senses that once something comes along that you know interferes with them, I can kind of see like that is a you know a, a worse nightmare for a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, it's a uh, fear of the unknown. It's something that the very early Doctor Who episodes played to magnificently. Yeah. Um, back in the 60s, they had the BBC radio team providing them with all this assistance with the sound effects. Yeah. And the sets were really dark. You couldn't see it much at all on your TV screen. But you had all this wonderful talent from the BBC radio uh, providing these eerie sound effects. This, and it was almost like a radio play with the occasional flashing feature <laughs> appearing in it. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. So I want to ask you about some of the authors that you that you admire. So in terms of sort of well-known and household name authors, who are some of the authors who, who've influenced you throughout the years? Well, Clive Barker mentioned previously, um, I think the person who actually influenced me the most, he isn't a horror author, but it's um, David Gemmell. Mm -hmm. I was um, I was raised reading him. I was absolutely blessed. My mother uh, was a librarian. Um, so I had the access to the entire school library service. And David Gemmell's works very much inspired me as a child. I've, I've been writing pretty much my whole life, um, but it's only recently that I got seriously into it. Yeah. And uh, it was David Gemmell and his books, which first introduced me to the, um, the real sort of character arc, the real um, characters moving from black to white and becoming a shade of grey and yeah I, I absolutely loved him. Cool awesome and I wanted to ask as well about um, I suppose like more like indie writers so have you come across any sort of 
throughout your throughout your travels that whose work you really admire? Well, I have a nemesis. <laughs> um, I did you get assigned a nemesis when you started off as a right author? No, I skipped that bit. All right. <laughs> no, uh, Charles X Cross. Uh, he's a perfidious knave in a gnarled toe. <laughs> so yes, no, I definitely have uh, a nemesis there. But um, uh, I, I did, and I'm, I'm struggling to remember his name at the moment. I will come back to you on this yeah. because um, I actually uh, I owned a games company for 12 years, and I reached out to him about um, doing a collaboration uh, using the game that I created at the time. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, we we're unable to make things work. But uh, I, yeah, I'll come back to you on that. Oh, no, that's awesome. And uh, tell me a little bit, a little bit more about this game company as well. So, you know, what was that about? And what, what were the, did you just have the one game or did you have a few? We had one flagship game. Um, the company was called Steel Crown Productions. Um, we produced a tabletop miniatures game called Exodus Wars. And it was a, a wonderful creative outlet for me at the time. I, I didn't have much time for writing. I was um, a contractor in the city. But um, I did have time to hire a team of people and produce this gaming system. And I would do the background and the blurb for all of the products. And everyone else would handle the sales and the manufacture. Uh, we even had a computer game. Uh, we franchised out and we sold the license to an Australian company, mm -hmm. Membrane Studios. And they produced a, a wonderful computer game of it. And then awesome. that carried on for about 12 years. And then um, I had some uh, mental health issues. Uh, so I sold off the company uh, to sort of reduce the pressures. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, moved into becoming a full-time author. Yeah. I mean, do you, were there any sort of transferable skills there? Because I guess, were you working on things like world building and characterization and, and all that for the game? So. There's world building in there. Um, there's also, you. every single character has to have a unique knack. You okay. have to, if someone's gonna buy it, they're gonna want a reason for it. Um, and when you give the sculptor instructions, you can't just say, I want a man with a gun. Yeah. You have to give them characteristics. And some of them can be just purely external. Uh, like we had uh, a character, it was a dwarf type character known as the Kazari. And we have one of our miniatures, which is known internally as Kazari with extreme hair. <laughs> um, but then you would then in the blurb, you would build up their backstory and you would give people a reason to buy this particular miniature. And because often they're going to use it for their own games and for their own purposes. But by giving them a narrative to go with it, you inspire them as to its role. And so one of the things that brought home to me was you've got one paragraph to sell this character. So you need to give him something that defines him. Yeah, it's like kind of coming up with a hook. I suppose it also teaches you like the, the value of being sort of direct and, and to the point as well, because it forces you to, if you've only got one paragraph, it forces you to pack as much into that paragraph as you can. Absolutely, absolutely. And when you're doing a campaign structure as well, I mean, that in its way is a story arc. Yeah. Yeah. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with horror author Newton Webb, and this is The Phenomenots with friends like you. Drunk again. 
confess all my feelings to a stranger. That was Friends Like You by The Phenomenots. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and I'm here in conversation with horror author Newton Webb. I want to ask you um, for a few little definitions here, because I was having a look around your website and um, sort of seeing the way oh, you talk Lord. about things. Yeah. Well, so one of the things you talked about is uh, you used the term creeping horror, and I wondered what's the difference between creeping horror and regular horror? I think it comes down to horror and terror, in a way. Um, <laughs> So rather than having um, in your face jump scares, which I write in some of my works, um, I like to start off with an environment that everybody can recognize, that everybody feels safe in. 
And then you just take a few items in that environment that seemed so homely and change them just subtly so that when people are reading it, um, it, it starts, it creates a feeling of unease. Yeah. Something isn't right here. And it can be as in your face as you're walking through the woods. It's a wonderful day, but there are no insects and there are no birds. It's utter silence. It's yeah. creating this pervading sense of escalating dread, which then allows you later on to really up the tempo. And um, you also talked about pulp literature. And I thought that was, in <laughs> I thought that was interesting because you know, when I think of pulp, I suppose I think of, you know, old school fantasy, sci-fi and old school horror and things like that. Um, so I wondered what, what does, you know, what would you say pulp literature looks like in the 21st century? I think it's mostly fan fiction. Uh, that's, that's the way that I uh, sort of see it. And um, a lot of the stories, so I wrote um, a fair few original works when I was younger, but I really cut my teeth. I was writing stories for fan fiction blogs. I wrote for a fan made magazine called Incoming. Yeah. And I was in charge of the sort of creative writing there and every issue I would give them a new short story and it was a Warhammer 40k short story. Yeah. And I would sometimes I would try and sort of do a more traditional style of story. Uh, but they never came across well. And so I learned that you have to be really, really punchy. The action scenes have to be incredibly vivid and preferably you need a minimum of one decapitation. <laughs> There's not much room for character growth or exploration when you're writing 40k fan fiction. Yeah. And um, I really enjoyed doing it. I absolutely loved it. And it's, well, it's something that I sort of do play with when I do my own action scenes and it sort of comes back to that. But um, yeah, I do like being able to write longer works and being able to get a more character driven narrative. Yeah, it's funny, actually, I was just thinking as you were talking as well, I think I saw, I think it was a discussion video or something like that, that I saw on YouTube. Um, and they were talking about uh, creepypasta and like how that is kind of, is like almost a new frontier of horror and a new sort of uh, new genre in, it, in itself, really. And I suppose that's kind of similar as well. So you know, people writing little horror stories on Reddit and things like that. That's kind of the pulp literature of horror of the 21st century. Absolutely. When I sort of refer to uh, Warhammer 40k fiction yeah. as pulp, uh, that is a, a huge disservice to some of the fantastic authors on there. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, especially some of the fantasy stuff written by Kim Newman. I, that was mind blowing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, Gotrick and Felix will always be comfort food for me. Uh, well, I, sitting back and reading their stuff is magnificent. Well, I, I think as well, I mean, so for example, fan fiction has got generally quite a bad rep, but actually there's some real, like, real talent there. It, it kind of reminds me a bit of just sort of indie publishing and self-publishing in general, where, you know, there is, there is, let's be honest, there is quite a lot of rubbish out there, but there's also some absolute gems. So it's kind of a case of, I don't know, for me, it makes it more interesting because sometimes you don't know what you're going to get. So, um, uh, so yeah, I think it's kind of fun how that, how that reflects that. But also there are a lot of um, like pretty well-known authors who started with fan fiction as well. Like I think the classic one. Is, Absolutely. Is, what was it? Was it Fifty Shades of Grey that started? Yeah, as, Fifty Shades of Grey. That was Twilight Yes, fan twi fiction. Twilight fan fiction. And then and she, um, E.L. James, she, last time I checked anyway, she, I think she was like the top, highest earning author in in the UK or something like that like literally she's earning tens of millions if not more ev every year so you know there's there's a place for it for sure yeah absolutely and I just remembered it's the progenitor trilogy by Dan Worth awesome cool. I, I truly recommend it he's a independent author and yeah he, it blew me away and that's that's another great example again of just how indie writing can be it can be just as good as anything that traditional publishing has got to offer I mean I think yeah. the thing the way I always sort of see it is that I mean especially these days traditional publishing they have to make they have to make their money back basically so yeah that's why you see so many books being published like it's kind of regardless of quality so sometimes the quality is really good sometimes not so much but to them it, it it's less about publishing an amazing book and more about making sure that you sell enough uh, enough copies so 
publishing an amazing book is going to help, but if, if you can publish a book by, I don't know, Rihanna or someone who's got like 40 million Twitter followers, then yeah. that's just, you're just going to do that rather than take a chance. And you kind of can't really fault big publishing houses no. for doing that. They, you know, they have to, to survive. So yeah, you need a, um, a guaranteed or as close to a guaranteed return on your investment. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And, um, and that happens uh, and you don't get the sort of editing handholding that you used to in the day as well yeah. because again uh, they're looking for known names and um not trying to dilute uh your sort of your message yeah which as an author starting out um i i absolutely have used a story editor um on my novel and i have to say the handholding magnificent yeah um she read through um, her, I'll find her name. Uh, she read through my novel and she gave me some really, really good feedback. Um, she helped me with, um, I had a point of view character who didn't have a defined character arc. Yeah. And she quite bluntly said to me, she said, uh, okay, uh, I sort of feel that she's been shoehorned into this um, role. Yeah. And what I really want to know is why should we care about her? Yeah. Uh, and it's things like that that just really bring home. And it should have been obvious, but I read through it and then I thought, hmm, you're right. Yeah. And so I completely rewrote uh, the book with this feedback in place. And it's been tremendously improved by it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of easy to get blinded to it with your own work as well, because, you you know, by the time your books come out, you've probably read it a, a dozen times or whatever. Oh, God. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it drives you insane. I've done, so I rewrote the first chapter over 20 times. Yeah. And um, I've done seven full edits of the novel. And it's, um, I'm so glad that it's just being uh, the last edit that was done on it. It yeah. was passed to a copy editor. Um, I grew up uh, quite heavily dyslexic. And yeah. so my, my grammar is appalling. Uh, but luckily, I've, I've got a good team of people who help me with punctuation. Yeah. Uh, so I can stick to the stories. Um, and yeah, by the time it came around to edit seven, it was very, very difficult. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I think it's quite interesting, you've got a bit of a, a presence on Spotify. Uh, what can you tell us about that? <laughs> um, so I'm a member of a writing group. Mm -hmm. And um, as part of the writing group, uh, what we do is we read out sections of our particular um, fiction that we've been working on that week. And I got used to reading out my stories as part of being a member of this writing group. So um, when a friend of mine um, from Aylesbury, he told me that he was having difficulty finding time to read my stories uh, because he has to drive everywhere for his job. Yeah. And he asked me if there was any way to sort of get them on Audible. And I didn't want to sort of go down the full audio book route yeah. just yet um that's something that i will look at and if i do so i will get a uh, proper actor um mm -hmm. i have acted in the past but um nothing uh two extremes um so i decided right well i'll i'll just read out a few of my books and um see how it goes and put them on spotify so um tales of the macabre is my podcast on Spotify. I do a new episode every week. Uh, sometimes it's a complete short story by me, and sometimes it is a section of a novella that I've written, uh, one or two chapters. And I did experiment a couple of times by doing short stories by other well-known authors. Mm -hmm. um, but... I think because it was going to my mailing list, people mostly wanted to see the uh, short stories that I'd created. Yeah. So I've, um, I've cut down on that now and I'm only doing the sort of short stories that I've written. 
and every week I put out a new episode. And sometimes I absolutely love it. I really get into it. I really enjoy doing the characters and it's an absolute joy to do. And then there are other times when I sit down and I go, ah, oh, oh no, the podcast has got to go out tomorrow. Ah, uh, and it takes um, a stiff coffee to sort of get me in the mood. <laughs> What's next for you and where can people go to find out more? <laughs> well, the easiest place to find out about me is on my website, which is newtonweb.com with two Bs. And you'll find my podcast on there. You'll find all of my stories are there available to read for free online. And then what's next for me is my full release as a published author on Amazon. That will be the 22nd of June when my first short story, Hunted, is released. And after that, every three weeks, a new story will be going up on Amazon for sale. Big thank you to Newton Webb for joining me. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Caitlin McAvoy with Beautiful.
like your book I read it too I studied law just like you I got good grades honors and A's but not your job That was Your Fear by Fabulous Parfait, and before that we had Beautiful by Caitlin McAvoy. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Rylight Zone to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. Over to Twanglin' Jack. Beck Odelay. There was a lot of this sample-based rock stroke hip-hop back in the 90s, but unlike Moby's use of old blues and Fatboy Slim's surf and soul, Beck seemed to veer more towards Americana. He first became well known with his song Loser, which was bluesy with slide guitar. On this album, he seems to favour one of those old harmonica mics to give it some of that beef heart old heart boy blues with authentic distortion. There is also a bit of country and some distorted rock guitar, all played to the kind of dancey drum samples popular at the time. He plays a lot of real instruments, but it's the samples that makes it all stand out. He uses them to add appropriate texture and also to surprise and amuse. I recently heard the opening song Devil's Haircut on a brand new Netflix drama and it did not sound dated. The song I remember hearing a lot on the radio at the time was New Pollution, catchy and unusual, with an inappropriate sampled intro of a religious family vocal group singing a cheery vocal instrumental melody. And then there is Where It's At with Dawes Electric Piano and a catchy hip-hop chorus. 
This album often appears at the top of lists, especially of classic albums of the 90s. He has made much more music in different styles, but this remains his classic, and a classic of its time, Odelay by Beck. Big thank you to Twanglin' Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Newton Webb for coming on and being a guest and also for treating us to a little foray into the Rye Light Zone. Thank you as well to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. You can find us on Facebook. If you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And you can listen again. We're repeated Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and this is Waterfall with Bundle of Sticks. I'll catch up with you next week. Society sits the wise old man, a guardian of decency in the world gone mad. He sees the boy men racing by, imaginary garlands round their heads, endless words dripping from their lips. They don't hear him say. See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix Though they break us like twigs, don't untie See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix Though they break us like twigs, don't untie They're soaring eagles aim and high the wise old man is on the ground From the flight across the sky They never hear the wisdom in his words See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix Alone they break just like twigs stoned on tie See this bundle of sticks is strong because of its mix Alone they break just like twigs stoned on tie So